Today, all hail the mighty US dollar. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest posts covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined again by Salvador Bavarnis. Hello, Salvador. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me back on the show. Great to have you once again. And uh, at the end of the last show, you really dropped a couple of uh, very interesting <laughs> leading thoughts. I just had to follow up, right? So today, we're going to talk about the US dollar, the great US dollar, right. all hail the US dollar. <laughs> and perhaps also talk about it in the context of what's happening with digital currencies, sure. and because uh, the two things are a bit, a bit connected. But uh, let's start with the the US dollar, cornerstone currency, been there for a long time, but potentially perhaps under a bit of pressure. Well, I think been there for a hundred years. The U.S. dollar has been the global currency ever since the transition during World War One between the dollar and the pound as the world's reserve currency. Of course, the United Kingdom went off the gold standard during World War One and really struggled to go back on the gold standard. Yeah. But even before World War One, the dollar was already the dominant currency, not only in Latin America, where there was an explicit program of what's called dollar diplomacy, but also in Asia. In fact. East Asia has never been a pound zone. Other than Hong Kong, East Asia has always been a dollar zone. Interestingly, first it was the Mexican dollar, <laughs> and we can get into that in the 16th century, and then ultimately during the 19th century, segueing into the US dollar without ever going through a pound phase. Now, today, I've heard these this talk for decades. I'm 50 years old now. And for the three decades of my adult life, each decade I've heard the dollar is going to be replaced as the world's currency. In the first decade, it was the yen that was going to replace it. In the next decade, it was the euro, the forthcoming euro that was going to replace it. After that, of course, it was the uh, yuan, the Chinese yuan that was going to replace it. And none of this has ever happened. The dollar is actually absolutely more dominant, not relatively more dominant, absolutely and relatively more dominant today than it has ever been. In fact, 88% at the last BIS survey, Bank for International Settlement Survey, 88% of all international currency transactions involved the US dollar. In effect, if you want to change Australian dollars into anything else, the bank's going to change it into US dollars first and then use that as a reference currency to change it into the other currency. <laughs> Yes, and I guess the Fed's recent activity, which is not only supporting the financial system right. in the US, but extending those swap lines uh, into other international um, uh, central banks, illustrates the fact that the, really the dollar is the underpinning of the uh, Western financial system. Well, the Federal Reserve realized in 2008, 2009, during the global financial crisis, that it had to support not only American banks, but foreign central banks. Now, this has become very controversial in the United States because nothing in the legislation enabling the Federal Reserve says that they're there to support the European Central Bank. Yet during the global financial crisis, the US Federal Reserve had to make hundreds of billions of dollars available to the European Central Bank in order to stabilize the European economy. Uh, Euro, the Euro has never taken off as a global currency. Of course, as a currency block, it's on a par with the dollar. But in global usage, it's nothing. And in a desperate attempt, I mean, the most embarrassing thing for the euro is that in the early 2000s, the first decade of the 2000s, in an embarrassing attempt to try to get people to use the euro, the European Central Bank even tried to get it to be used by international organized crime. <laughs> if you may remember the 500 euro note. Now, no one I know has ever seen a 500 euro note because... Who needs to carry 500 euros in your pocket? But their idea was, and of course, they never said this in public, but the idea was that you know those suitcases of cash being held by organized crime, well, could they be converted from dollars to euros? A $100 note is much less value than a 500 euro note. And so instead of holding huge stacks of dollars, they could hold smaller stacks of euros. And even with that effort, organized crime, ISIS in the Middle East, none of them wanted to move over to the euro. And so the dollar remains the global currency even today. In fact, when the International Monetary Fund expanded its basket of reference currencies for underlying the, uh, the International Monetary Unit, 
it included the Chinese yuan at the expense of the euro, the pound, and the yen, not at the expense of the US dollar. <laughs> right. And I guess the other thing to say is that um, a re very small proportion of dollars are actually physical notes, right? Most of it's right, of course. electronic records and uh, electronic transactions. And as you say, international trade absolutely supported by the US dollar and uh, essentially the conduct of well, trade relies on it. Well, three years ago when China, which has worked very hard to internationalize use of the yuan, when China started its own imperialistic efforts to become a development financier around the world with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB raised its money in dollars, <laughs> priced its share in dollars, made its loan in dollars. Now, they've tried to make some loans in other currencies, but uh, for the most part, the AIIB operates entirely in US dollars. Now, if even China's investment bank <laughs> is running in US dollars, Everyone's working on dollars. And that's not because of U.S. hegemony. I mean, I always remind people who say that the United States is somehow imperialistically forcing people to use the dollars. Everywhere I go in the world, people want to hold dollars. And so when there's a crisis occurs, when the 2008-2009 financial crisis occurred in the United States, what happened? The dollar rose. When the COVID-19 crisis occurred, what happened? The dollar rose. Rose. It, it's not about the United States forcing people to use a dollar. It's about people wanting to be part of the American system. And that goes back to things we talked about in the last program about the centrality of, of the United States in globalization. The pre-globalization world was a world of competing countries and competing blocks. And of course, if you were in that Soviet bloc, you used the ruble. Uh, before that, if you go before 1914, all of Central Europe used the Deutschmark because they were part of the Deutschmark. The, the British, before 1914, the British Commonwealth all used the pound. But globalization has meant that people now have a choice to use any currency they want. Once they had the choice, they all gravitated towards the center. Power tends to concentrate at the center of networks. And so that power is concentrated in the United States. Ironically, it was the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. I mean, if you go back to 1968, the Bretton Woods, so-called Bretton Woods system of, of managed floating, of managed float for currencies, where you couldn't get international exchange. I mean, if you in Australia wanted to purchase international currency, you had to get a license to do it, right? It wasn't freely available. When that whole system linked to the dollar fell apart because the U.S. could no longer supply the gold to keep the dollar at its mandated level, everyone thought back in 1968 that if the U.S. went off the dollar standard, well, that was it, and we would return to a multipolar world of competing currencies. And in fact, the dominance of the dollar was only strengthened by eliminating the link to gold instead of being reduced. That hard commodity link, in fact, did not help the dollar. It held it back. And that's a cue to talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> Absolutely. Just before we go there, because I do want to touch sure. on Bitcoin, Mark Carney at Jackson Hole last year, that's sort of the central bankers uh, right. get together, right? Um, made a very interesting speech because he actually said that um, there was no guarantee that the US dollar will necessarily maintain right. its dominance into the future. And he basically said, you know, there are a number of different futures. One is dollar stays there. Another is it could be the, um, the yuan or it could be some digital uh, alternative. And he actually was advocating potentially that there might be a role right. for a digital alternative. Now, um, it seems to me that the US dollar is such a centrally connected uh, feature of the c uh, currency now that it's more likely if that would happen, it would be a digital dollar rather right. than actually another currency. Or is that... Yeah. Um, now, I don't have any insights into Carney's mind, but of course, he is a Canadian who was running who was running the Bank of England. And people all over the world outside the U.S. and even many in the U.S. have wished for an end to dollar dominance because it's not always good for the United States. I mean, it sounds great. You know, oh, we're Americans and the dollar is strong. In fact, in many ways, it's a problem for the United States. So the U.S. dollar is too strong. It harms U.S. exporters. Uh, Donald Trump has been was talking down the dollar. I mean, he always said we want a strong dollar. 
but he wanted a strong dollar at a lower exchange rate for out, throughout the first two years of his presidency. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily good for the United States, but people choose to participate in these networks. So the problem with any alternative, I mean, Carney may want an electronic alternative, but hey, you've already got alternatives. You've, you've, you've got special drawing rights at the IMF as an alternative. You've got the Euro as an alternative. There's no shortage of alternatives. Back in the 1980s, you had the yen as an alternative. The Deutschmark used to be an alternative. The point is that people instantly change whatever currency they get into dollars because they perceive the dollar to be the most liquid currency. And they don't just perceive, it is the most liquid currency. So for example, with the depth of US bond markets, meaning that anyone who needs to put money into bonds or quickly liquidate it out of bonds, well, where are you going to do that? U.S. bond markets, right? That's where you're going to put your money if you need to be able to have it in a very liquid form where you still earn returns. Now, no new digital replacement currency is going to have trillion dollar a day bond markets attached to it. No trillion, uh, no new electronic reserve currency is going to have the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ attached to it, where you can very easily invest your money in a completely liquid market that you know, no matter how catastrophic things get, you can get your money out tomorrow. You know, you're not going to have to sit on it. And thus, and thus the United States, the centrality of the United States remains there, no matter what alternatives people propose. And that cult also, I'll, I'll make the segue myself, that holds also for Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a great idea in principle as a currency. In practice, it has become an asset class. And in fact, you can think of all other currencies as asset classes. You know, there's one currency in the world. You might invest in another currency. I'll, I'll make this very personal. I myself held my super fund, although it's held in Australia and denominated in Australian dollars, I held it mainly in US shares. When we had the crisis and share markets dropped, well, the Australian dollar dropped much more than the US dollar. So I temporarily moved my retirement savings into Australian shares because I invested them in the asset class, the Australian dollar. Now, of course, while I'm parking them in Australian dollar, I put them in the Australian stock exchange. But when the Australian dollar comes back up against the US dollar, I'll go back into the big markets. Because I don't want my retirement savings in this narrow little parochial market that is the Australian Stock Exchange. I want my retirement savings in Google, Microsoft, Amazon. And for that, I need to be in the New York markets. Now, my analysis at my little level for my tiny super fund is the same for everybody globally. Uh, and thus, not only is Bitcoin an asset class that is den effectively denominated in dollars, but the Australian, the entire Australian economy for everyone outside Australia is simply an asset class denominated in US dollars. And let's just be very really clear, when you say an asset class, right, there is some um, perceived value to that particular set of assets, but it's always translated back to the benchmark right. US dollar. That's the critical point, isn't it? If you are a global investor, you're denominating your investments in dollars. Yep. And if you want to diversify investments, you might diversify by investing in gold, by investing in Bitcoin, by investing in Australian shares, by investing in Chinese shares. But you're not necessarily just investing in those various shares to take a position on those share markets. You're investing in those shares to take a position on those currencies. So in effect, those currencies for non-Australians, the Australian dollar, is in effect an asset class. That is, they might hold Australian dollars, hoping the Australian dollar will go up. Mm. Yeah, okay. Right, so what you're really saying is then that uh, it ain't going to be beaten anytime soon, and uh, we had better accept the fact that it's there. It's the cornerstone of the economic structure that we're actually part of. Well, it's there in the same way the pound was there. The pound was there for you know a little more than 100 years. Mm. Uh, the difference between the dollar and the pound is that the pound remained there even when other economic parts of the world vastly overshadowed the UK. Mm. I mean, by 1914, the US economy was already about four times the size of the British economy. <laughs> and yet still, the pound zone encompassed most of the world outside of the Americas and China. Even with that 
looming American economy because networks are incredibly stable. Everyone wants to be at the center of the network. And until 1914, the world's networks converged on London. Now, today, they still converge to a large extent on London, but London has become an offshore hub for New York. And it's amazing, the densest flight corridor in the world before 2020, <laughs> the densest flight corridor in the world when flights were flying was not New York, Los Angeles. It was New York, London. Mm. Right? So London, in effect, was an offshore and remains an offshore financial center for New York. Now, it's by far the most important offshore financial center. But what do they trade in London? They trade euro dollars. Right? The foundation of London as a financial center is the euro dollar market. Uh, they're trading in dollars, even though they're trading them in London. And that's the story globally. Uh, thus, when Facebook tried to set up a digital currency, and they're still trying, I guess, the, the Libra, Facebook wanted to be, I can only think they wanted to be politically correct. Mark Zuckerberg seems to have this political correctness thing. And he didn't want to seem like the imperialistic American company pushing the American currency. So he wanted the Libra to be based on a basket of currencies. Nobody wanted to participate in it. Why? Because when you buy a you know, video game via Facebook, you want to know how much it's going to cost you. And either that means in dollars, or that means you want to know what it's going to cost you in your local currency. We could imagine a dollar Libra, where everybody just thought, well, I have to, you know, whatever local country I'm in, I have to acknowledge that the pricing is in dollars. Or we can imagine a local Libra. You know, every country has its own Libra. Mm -hmm. What I can't imagine is an independent Libra that's a basket of currencies. Because who wants to hold that, right? Everyone would instantly put their money back into their own currencies or into dollars. They wouldn't hold their money in Libra as a store of value. Mm. And that's the problem for anyone trying to bring down these networks. Now, London was brought down eventually, but London was brought down not just by World War I. It was brought down by World War I after it had already shrunk to a quarter of the size of the largest economy in the world. Well, that's not going to happen to the United States in this century. I, I mean, I'm not going to make predictions. I always tell people, if you're going to make predictions, get the timeline right. You know, Every prediction has a timeline. Uh, I can tell you that it's not going to rain for the next two minutes, just looking at the sky. Tomorrow, who knows? Uh, US dollar dominance, I'll guarantee you till the end of the century, You know, past when I die. The 22nd century, all right. You know, I don't know what's going to happen then. But the 21st century is another dollar century. Very well. Well, I probably won't be around in uh, 50 years' time to, <laughs> to check whether you were right or not. But with the, but the your, avatar, will... <laughs> your avatar will. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. So your avatar and my avatar might have a conversation. Said, See, you were right. <laughs> um, all hail the great dollar. Thank you very much. Uh, so a very, very interesting conversation. And uh, I think that's a really important perspective, actually, because you know there's been a lot of talk about uh, the dilution of power from the US dollar. And uh, I think you've uh, made a very cogent argument as to why it's going to be there forever. Right. Thanks, Martin. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. Take care.